So let me get the slides moving. So say hi in the chat. It really helps me understand who's here, who we're gonna, who's gonna just, you can say hi, where you're from. It just helps a lot. And you'll see why my next slide, few slides will explain exactly why it's important. The chat is the most important thing here for me. Um, Nebraska, okay, yeah, and I'm in Brooklyn, so I'm way out there. Um, and it's kind of awesome that I'm getting an opportunity to present to communities that I couldn't normally reach. And um, I think I'm going to go ahead and kind of emphasize that. And this is the titles like the Web Forum Module's Greatest Hits in an AMA. I think the AMA is the most important thing to me. And I'll start off with just an introduction. You know, my name is Jacob Rockwitz. I'm known as J Rockwitz on the web. Um, and I'm a Drupal developer and software architect. I built and tamed maintain the web form module for Drupal 8. And this is a different spin from my typical presentation. Uh, a few things here. One, it's targeted to online. And I'm breaking it up into segments so that I can focus on different themes for each segment. And each segment ends with a Q&A. And everyone's adopted the ask your questions with a capital Q while I'm speaking. I'm you seeing me look over to the right because I am watching the chat while I'm talking. It's like one of the new skills I've found while doing this. And I, I got to emphasize, this is my goal here. Even though there's nine people on this in this presentation, ask your questions. This is your opportunity. This is, frankly, I think this session is going to turn to choose your own adventure because that's really my goal here is to put content out there that allows you to steer it in different directions. So if I'm talking about one topic and you, if you miss something or want something more, ask about it. Um, and so here's the playlist for this presentation. And it, the first five are really just going and giving you the lay of the land with the web form module. Talked about forms, submissions, configuration, elements, and handlers. Those are the five key driving things um, behind the web form module. And the other five are people have asked me questions about these topics. So I've decided to focus on them a little bit, talking about conditional logic, spam handling, which is outside the web form module, security, and headless Drupal comes up. I actually just watched the um, session on generating static sites in Tomb and web form was, came up and I kind of want to address that. And then ultimately I'll end with support. I am working on these bonus tracks and I'm pointing them out to you because you can ask questions about these topics. One, I, I have some slides about tokens because they're really complex and sometimes people just need me to walk through them. But there's stuff about select options, multi-step forms, access controls, submission limits, modal dialogues, PDF generation, I hint at. APIs and hooks is really, if there's a developer and they want to get me, I can I can open up my ID and show a lot. Um, I do have demos of other advanced functionality, and then I can talk about a lot of add-on modules. So if you're looking for a certain feature, there's a list of add-ons, and I can just walk through some of those. But let, let's start off with the form builder. Um, so I have song, like song titles for each one of these sections. Or sec, yeah, tracks. I'm not pretty, but I'm powerful. And it really sums up how I feel about the web form modules form builder. It provides a simple UI for creating forms. Uh, the form builder is accessible via keyboard and, and screen readers to all users. I put this in all my presentations. The reason being, I want to emphasize that the web form module has accessibility thought out, out of the box. And the actual UI to build the form is fully accessible. There's no keyboard traps. If you're using a screen reader, you can navigate around. And with that said, all the forms you build have a high level of accessibility. We take it very seriously, and I'm, I'm kind of proud of that. And this is for the developer series. You know, Developers can see and edit the YAML source behind the, the form. It gives you a lot of information on how things are set up. And what I like here is just to do a demo. So sorry they didn't get to the login, but it's pretty easy to move around. Just logging into my demo site, navigating to web forms. We lost a half, a quarter, you know, a few seconds to this. And give me one minute. Sorry about that. Usually what I do is I load this. And this is, I've got a bunch of forms here. And I start out with a contact form. Now we're good. So we are familiar with a simple contact form. And for the demo, I'm like just saying I want to add a company field to here. So I'm going to go over to the builder. And this is the builder. And you can add elements. I'm going to add a text field. I'm going to call it company. Let's scroll down. We're not going to go through all these settings right now. I'm just going to add it to the bottom of the form. 
and you can view it over here. You see there's company album. There's a mistake here where it should say your company, it should come below your name and should be required. So we're gonna go back to the form builder and address that mistake. And you could definitely do that in the UI. You could check required, hit save, move it, edit it. But this is a really good opportunity to show you the source mode. This is a simple example, but this is the source code behind all the elements on a form. So what I'm doing is I'm copying the company element, I'm just moving it up. I'm changing the label and I want to make it required. And I'm copying this property. And, and really the goal here is to show you the power of, you can change all the labels at once. You can see everything going on with your form. You could set your own custom prop. You could set the properties. You can copy whole sections of one form to another. And, and frankly, you can really learn how Drupal's form API works by looking at this source. I'm going to hit save. Yes. John, find a replace. I mean, frankly, I cut and paste. I do a lot of this in my ID. I cut and paste this over to the ID and start manipulating it. It's a lot easier. Okay, I've done save. I'm now gonna go over to the test tab. And what I like with the test tab is it just shows you, it just populates the form. This is not a hard form to fill out, but this, uh, it will fill out a form with 100 inputs with logical defaults at work. And then you can hit send and test the form. It speeds up the process a lot. Boom, we've submitted the form, and now we have the message, and this has gone into the results table. And really, we focus on the first thing, building a form, the form builder. Let me keep going. And so some tips and tricks. I didn't show it. I think I am going to demo it. If there's, a, if there's other questions, I'll go there. But there's admin titles that you can add. So if you have a really long question, an admin title is a way to put a little short string that will be displayed in the admin UI, or someone downloads it or if they're sorting a table. It makes a difference, it cleans things up and people just don't know about it. Um, that developers and site builders should know how to use the YAML source mode. This makes you a better Drupal developer if you're familiar with it. Um, it makes you better at theming because that's what the theme is, it's a render API. And conversely, this is a permission, it's a permission to edit YAML code in the web form module and don't allow untrusted or non-technical users to access the source. Um, you got to think about that, manage that part of the configuration. Who has access to what? Are there any questions so far? Um, what I like to do is if there's no question, I, I throw a question. Well, what other cool features are, have been added to the, the form builder? And there's one that I want to kind of call out because I think it reinforces the admin title. So we don't want it to say your name in the UI. We're going to go over to the edit tab. I'm going to show you where admin title is, and it's a recent feature that was added. And you have to imagine very long advanced forms where this feature kicks in nicely. So I can change this to name, but I can add admin notes. This is an admin note. And then I can hit save. And what it does is it adds a little tooltip here. And for really big forms, I had to add this. So it gives a little help, a little explanation. Well, if you have really complex conditional logic or there's something that someone needs to know, it gives a little note that just sits next to the name. And this name will follow through everywhere you are in the admin UI, except when you view the form. Okay, I'm gonna keep going. The mission management. And really we've switched gears. We had a form, we click submit. That's about show me the data, show me what's going on. And in submission management, you get a table of results and those columns can be customized. Individual reviewers can customize their results so they can decide what columns are visible, like you have multiple people coming in. Submissions can be flagged or locked. You can also add notes and you can export those submissions. And finally, if you don't like the out of the box results table, you can replace that entirely with a view. And the demo, I'm actually gonna go back to the test tab I'm going to just generate 50 submissions. I think it just helps. So the idea is this is where you want, might want to te test the bulk capacity of your web form. So you could generate thousands of submissions. I've just done 50, and now we've got a table of 50 records. And to do the customization, you can go in, uncheck. We could, put, we could even leave the flagging in the notes column. And usually what happens is you pick the elements, and maybe the operations, and ID. And what I'm doing is removing all that extra data here. And you get a much simpler. And when I say flag, you could star something to call it out as important. 
which allows you to filter it here. You can lock. Locking just means people can't edit. It's very good if you have a review process. And you can add some notes. Um, also, and I had hinted, there's some PDF support. And I like showing this feature. And I hope it works. I failed last time. You can convert the submission to a PDF. Ah, doesn't work. I have to sort this one out. Um, trust me, it will generate a PDF. It's my machine having a problem with the PDF generator. But what also is powerful is you can take that submission converted to a PDF, but you get this download. And for the demo, I'm going to show this online, but you can download every submission as a PDF. Generally, if you're archiving something, you might want a PDF record of every submission. But for now, I'm going to give you the HTML table, which can be opened in Excel. Once again, you can customize all the aspects of this, what labels are displayed, how they're displayed, what columns. For this, I'm just going to show you the table. I'm going to hit download. And it's going to render it online because I'm not downloading it. And you get this HTML table. And I'm just showing it to you online. But this would open up in Excel. And you could go customize it and work with it in Excel. I'm going to click out. I'm going to get back to the main section. And for web form views integration, it's hard to show you how to do it. So I kind of wanted to call out some add-ons. And that's kind of the great thing about Drupal is there's a module for that. And so there is a web form views module to help with integration. The web form submission views token field, it, it really does a different approach. Like the web form views module provides all the columns and it can get really complex. The submission view token allows little tokens to be in, inserted into your web form submission view where you can pull any data. Different approach. I like it. I think it has a lot of potential. And, and for developers, the web form query module kind of brings up the key thing worth noting is web form submissions are entities, but they do not use field API to store the data. It uses an entity attribute value model. That's basically a way to store a lot of data, which is different than field API. It's performance, and you're getting lots of arbitrary sets of data. So this module gives you an API similar to the entity query, where you can say web form submission query and pull data from your web form submission data table. It's a single table. That's a farthest I kind of go into the you know backend aspects of the web form module. Are there any questions about submissions? It's fine if there's not. We're going to get into some more complex things. Configuration, we have tons of questions. I'm going to start hinting at things in a certain direction. Everything and anything can change in the web form module. And you know, you can change the default labels and behaviors of every aspect of a web form. You can disable elements, handlers, and more. So you could say, I don't want this element available. You can disable external libraries. If you don't like a certain library, you can say, I don't want this library. Maybe I'll have something in my theme. And you can configure third-party settings. That really comes down to, we'll talk about it in spam protection, but that allows other modules to add settings to your web form configuration. And the demo is, I really want to get people familiar with what, what I mean when configuration settings. So when I go over to the settings of a web form, so we're in the web form, we've gone through the first three, we've gone through the first four tabs. We're in settings. By the way, there's a hierarchy to this. It starts from general to specific. Starts with a form, submission, confirmation. And think about it, after you get the confirmation, you're sending an email, you get into handlers and CSS and JavaScript and access, that's advanced functionality. And when you get here, you have all the options. You can turn off the saving of submissions, the URL, this is the third party settings for spam protection. I tend to just focus, I mean, there's a lot of settings here. I like, I'm kind of very proud of here. This is this panel here is all the behaviors you can add to a web form. And the idea here is to give you control. And a lot of these just depend on the form. I don't think we could auto focus the first element on every form, but if you have a form that people are coming back to over and over again, focusing on the first element is, is a really good idea. Um, what I do like to call out is you can change all the confirmation behaviors. Any confirmation behavior is kind of supported. You could have a dedicated page. What I demoed is it goes to a URL, which is the front page, and displays a message at the top. And you there's the default message. So we're talking about settings. All of these settings here have defaults. And we can get up to the defaults by going over to, to the configuration area. So settings are for the web form. Configurations are global to all web forms. And you can set defaults. Generally, it's default labels, but you can turn on and off global 
behaviors. For example, you could disable client-side validation for all your forms. I like to emphasize this section here. I recommend, every, like, I don't recommend tweaking all the configuration when you get started, but this one is worth paying attention to. It's your element types. So the web form module ships with a ton of elements. If you don't need a certain element, turn it off. The example would be, if you don't need file uploads, turn them off. The other thing, sorry about my clicking phone, um, the web form module does come with password elements, but they're off by default for good reason. It doesn't encrypt the data, so generally most people don't want to use these, but I wanted them available for developers. Um, you got to walk through all these settings, and I'll talk about some more. I'm actually going to move ahead and just kind of do the tips. Keep it simple. Use the defaults when possible. Disable unneeded functionality. And I kind of always like to end with a little developer tip. Is like, you can use hooks to change default settings. You can use, um, the, for web forms, it's hook underscore web form underscore create. And that's an entity hook where you can get in there and as a web form is being created, tweak default behaviors. You could just change messages, turn on and off certain things. You can do it globally, but sometimes people want to do it on certain web forms. Um, oh, I skipped a slide. Any questions? Okay, I'm going to keep going. But I actually am going to put, oh, hook form alt. That's a good question. Well, here's the thing with hook form alter. That's what um, John just threw out in a question. Um, we'll get into handlers, but web forms are entities. Generally, I'm going to throw out there, if possible, use the entity hooks. That means you're kind of writing a hook to tweak the underlying architecture behind a web form. Hook form alter, you're tweaking the output of the web form, and that has some capabilities. And I frankly, you know, certain areas you have to do it, but you want to be careful where it's sometimes better to alter the actual um, entity. Uh, and there are dedicated web form submission. Uh, there's an, a web form API.php module that kind of walks through all the hooks available in the web form module. And John, you can ask more specific questions about hooks as we're going through. Um, how are we on time? I am going to show one cool feature because I'm really proud of it. And something that came up recently we just added these menus that we added sub menus to the web form module, which makes it easier to navigate. And we added this ability, and it also makes it easier for me to jump around while I'm presenting, to promote the web form module as a top menu item. Instead of having it nested under structure, you can have it between content and structure. As by checking this box, and this is optional, but you get web forms as a top level item with its own icon. Give it a second because the cache has to clear to rebuild the menus and even the URLs get shifted a little bit so that they don't have structure in the path. Let's see. And here we go. We have a top level menu. It really depends on how important web forms are to your site, um, but it makes it easier for your site builders to get access to them. I am going to keep going. Elements. So every question matters. And there's a web form examples module that has a style guide. And this is a kitchen sink of every element. So we're scrolling through everything here. We're looking at all the file upload options, the Q kittens, ratings, signature elements. We're going to look at a Likert for a second. Um, the idea is it just shows you all the possibilities and it helps your designers understand how things are going to look and feel in the theme. That's a composite, which I'll talk about briefly. And then right at the bottom, you see those are for your designers to see all the possible element labels and messages. And, and frankly, the next slide shows you a really important, it zooms in on just what's possible with the labeling of your element. So there's support for tool tips, placeholders, descriptions, and more slide outs. I don't recommend doing this, turning on all of these for a form. Each one of these has a different use case. The example with tooltips is I use them heavily in the web form UI because you only want, most people only need to see this information once, so you tuck it away. Um, I use descriptions if it's very short and I need a little note, but more is incredibly helpful if you need full descriptions or definitions. I do healthcare forms and sometimes you have to say, you know, what is this information? And you have to slide out two paragraphs. And computed twig, people are using these a lot. It allows you to do calculations 
and they can go to the back end. So this is using Ajax to go pull user information. And it's showing you the back end code where it's just adding A plus B equals C. And you're going to see the twig. It's pretty fairly simple twig. You do have to make sure you have a number there. And then you turn off Ajax validation with it. Um, let's see the next. You get emailed. So you're pulling values. You, you selected a user and now you're using tokens to pull values about that user into your form. And there's some caveats here, I'll get to them. Composites are just multiple elements working together. Um, oh, I know what to do. Sorry for a second, my phone is beeping and I really find that distracting, solve that problem. Um, this is a composite, so it's, it's like creating profiles with people. So you can collect multiple users. There's some out of the box composites like address and contact, but you can build your own too. You can even build custom elements. This takes a second, but basically this is like a web component. You're setting up your HTML markup with Twig. You're adding your CSS for the markup. You can add JavaScript. You can even set default options. But then when you go to preview, you've got your own buttons. And keep in mind, you have full control over this markup. When this gets really interesting is an SVG graphic. So an SVG, of the United States with a data ID and type. Basically, you're setting an ID and text property. And by passing it in, you can create a clickable map of the United States that you can zoom in and out of. And once again, with accessibility, this is fully accessible. So the idea is it's layering JavaScript that's been thought out to allow keyboard access and screen information to be read aloud to the user as they're clicking on it. That use case might be for an event where you need people to pick the space. I use it for diagrams for in healthcare. Um, it's one of the more advanced features. So you're starting to get a hint that every aspect of an element is customizable. I, it's exhausting. There's probably about 40 properties you have per element from e how it looks and feels to how the validation works. Recommend always starting out with basic elements. That computed element is really nice, but you use the computed element with Ajax sparingly. It's an entire hit to the server. Having one or two in a form is okay. Having more than that can really slow down your site. Um, and this is, I'm not getting into how to build elements in code, but there's examples of it. If you look in the web form module, elements in code provide the most flexibility and stability. So you're in code defining exactly how your composite's going to work. And that's, then it can be reused throughout all your different forms and it goes into your Git repository. So you have a history of that code. Questions around elements. Okay. So we're going to go on to handlers. So we've collected the data, someone hits submit, and every action, that's an action, someone hits submit, should have a reaction. And these are the handlers that the web form module ships with. And basically, a handler handles a submission. So email would be the first one to think of. When someone hits submit, it sends an email, which we see in the contact form, even though I haven't shown you the email. Um, there's a remote post handler, which will take the data and move it to another server, which I'll demo in a little bit. Actions and settings are very similar to rules. Um, actions trigger a rule on a submission. So you could say if someone enter in conditional logic support, so if someone enters this value, lock the submission or flag the submission. And settings tweaks how a form's working. The most common scenario is if someone enters a certain value, you might want to change the confirmation page message or URL. And this gives you that ability to tweak how the form's going to work based on some submission information. Last one, debug really just shows you what's going on with the form. It gives you the raw data. Um, so adding a handler, there's in the settings, there's an email and handlers tab. I'm showing you the scheduled email handler where you can go and configure it. And really scheduled email handler is the same as the email handler. It's by the way, for the developers, it's extending that plugin and just adding scheduling. And now I'm adding an email handler. We can go in and set all the defaults. By the way, with most things you don't have to, for example, this demo, you don't have to change too many of the default settings, just the recipients. So all handlers support debugging. I'll show that too. So you turn that on, you see what's going on. And this goes back to the form alter thing is handlers can act on forms. So it can act on the build, validate, and submit of a form. And it can act on the entity, which is like create, save, and update. Um, it can even act on individual elements. For the developers, it's worth reading the web form handler interface to understand all the possibilities, all the different little places you, 
you can put information. They're like hooks, by the way. It's like a handler plugin basically is hooks on steroid because it's all tied into one object. Um, handler support conditional logic that solves a lot of problems for people. And yeah, they're extendable. So you can go in, if you don't like how the email handler is working, you can go extend that code. Questions about handlers. Um, we're at the halfway point and we're pretty good on time. I've got another 20 minutes, so I'm gonna keep going. So conditional logic invariance. It's all about asking the right question at the right time. And there's two concepts here. So conditional logic invariance allow you to tweak a form based on submission data. Both of them do the same thing. Conditional logic is limited to hiding and showing or requiring elements. And variance allow you to alter a form's labels and behaviors. Variants are much more powerful because they're literally going into the code behind a form and allowing you to change it. It's easier to demo conditional logic, and the demo is fairly simple, and it gives an opportunity to say, you know, web form supports templates, is a web form template module. And when I say template, it's like, here, if I do a preview of a medical request appointment form, this is an example of an appointment form. You can go customize this and change it, but it has a good use case for conditional logic. We're, we're asking the question, are you the patient or caregiver? And when you toggle between, conditional logic will hide and show the different elements. And what it's doing is hiding and showing, ready, it says patient information. When you say caregiver, it says your information, the caregiver information, and moves patient information below. Um, I'm going to select it. I'm going to create it. And I'm just going to show you the conditional logic in the builder. Give it a second to refresh. Hopin really loves to like eat my system's resources. If I go over to visible, and click on it, you get the conditional logic. What's the state? What's the trigger? Well, what element and what's the trigger value? You can add multiple states and you can kind of sort, you can have any and all. Um, you should explore conditional logic. But now let's go to variance. And variance is harder to demo. For, uh, before I go on, um, start with conditional logic. Always do, it's much easier. And it is, if you look at the source mode, you're gonna see pound states API. That's how conditional logic works. So you can actually write your own conditional logic in the source mode. Um, in that demo, I use containers to group related elements. So basically there's a div that I put a bunch of elements in, I apply the conditional logic to that container. It makes it easier to manage. And gradually implement variants. Variants definitely have a crawl, walk, run mentality. That means start simple and gradually get more complex. And so a variant is an alternate instance of a web form that adjusts settings, elements, or behaviors to yield a better result. And I like the yield a better result because it starts to target the three use cases I've kind of thought of with variants. You can do A-B testing, so a better result. You have an A version or a B version of a form. You can also do segmentation. So you can have audience A and audience B of a form. The example there is like that patient, that appointment form. You can tweak a form to target a patient more appropriately. So if you know someone's a patient with a variant, you could change the label to say, what was your diagnosis? And maybe if they even said, you know, it was, or when were you diagnosed? And if they say it was in the last month, you could have a special message that says, I'm sorry to hear that. Versus the caregiver, it's a different tone. You've got to say, um, you're, you know, to the caregiver, what's your information? But then you say, what's the, what is the patient's prognosis, not your prognosis? And that's another one. And finally, you could do personalization. I haven't done it, but the concept is you can, someone comes in and you could take their data and tweak the form completely. And this is a demo of A-B testing. So it's quickly going through and showing you an A-B version. And you're editing the source and deciding that you want a compressed form where it's side-by-side -side labels with a dropdown. But if you go to variant B to view it, you're getting radio buttons and vertical elements. And the idea is you can A, B test that, take your analytics, and actually apply the A or B to your form or leave them that way. Um, so tips and tricks around variants. They can support unlimited variations with no performance implications. Um, the second one kind of emphasize that. They can be used to organize 
audience or organization specific forums. I am currently working on a project where we have, I think it's going to be close to 80 different organizations coming in to use the forum. We know who they are, so we can give them a custom URL, which might be, you know, slash my forum slash the organization's name, uh, make up Coca Cola or something. And we also might want to have a custom phone number by, besides saying welcome Coke employees. And we have variants for that. And that allows it to be organized. It doesn't have any performance impact because basically it's taking the string, finding the code, and applying it. Um, and you can implement your own custom variant plugins. And the example I gave with an organization is I created a custom form where it's like, what's the name of the organization and what's their phone number? And that's it. It's very simple. And even in the UI, I'm reflecting that simple data. Questions around variants. It's a very complex topic. Okay. Spam protection. People ask this question all the time. How do we protect against spam? Um, and what's the bet? What spam modules do you recommend? I finally decided to come up with a recommendation. Well, stop sending me your junk is the theme of this song. And there's three that stand out. Honeypot, Antibot, and Captcha. Honeypot puts a little secret input. Antibot puts a little JavaScript that most bots don't support JavaScript. And Captcha asks really difficult questions that bots can't fill out. Um, every, I think people are very familiar with Captcha and maybe Honeypot. And you can find more spam protection modules because there's a dedicated add-ons tab in the Web4 module. It's near the end with the help. And this is listing out some of the spam modules. I did a keyword search on spam, so you're not getting if spam wasn't in the title, it's not there. I'm just showing the Honeypot landing page. And there's some tips and tricks here that are really important. I, I think, you know, Captcha works the best, but it's the most annoying. Um, it can really slow people down. It can frustrate them. And I got to stretch for a second. Honeypot could be good enough without annoying users. It's kind of a hidden element in the background. This last one, when I did the research on a recommendation, yeah, inaccessible, Kate, is a really valid point on CAPTCHA. So, you know, this is a huge one. And CAPTCHA does this too, which is why I steer away from it more and more. So spam protection modules may disable page caching. The truth is they disable page caching. When I say that, what it means is for anonymous users, if you have to ask an individual question via CAPTCHA, you have to turn off caching. The page cannot be cached. So you're taking a performance hit. Every time someone hits that form, it's got to load. Um, if you have certain other ones, Honeypot has a time limit. The time limit's tied to the user opening the form. That turns off cap. That turns off caching. Um, there is a recipe for good spam protection. And what it is, it's Honeypot. Honeypot has two options. It has a time restriction and a Honeypot. So if you turn on Antibot and Honeypot, that doesn't turn off page caching. The recipe is that there's a secret field that bots need to know how, to, like they can't figure out how to fill out properly. And Antibot puts a little JavaScript layer right in front of the form that they can't submit the form. I found this to work really well with no performance hit. Kind of walk through, oh, Antibot. Okay, accessible, yes. That's a great question, John. Antibot does require JavaScript for users to fill out the form. That it, it assumes that every user will have JavaScript. If they don't have JavaScript, it tells them that. It says you are unable to fill out the form. It has nicely placed no script tags. And a little technical thing, all it's doing is manipulating the action of a form element. So without JavaScript, that action points to just a dead page. It points to like, you're, you're a bot, go away. And with JavaScript, it just replaces the action. And it works really well. It's really a well thought out system. Um, Granted, the bots are getting smarter and smarter, and they're starting to understand JavaScript. So this question is, how do you secure submission data? And it kind of brings up some interesting recipes here. First off, the song is, I don't trust you. I don't trust anyone. That's a lesson I've learned over the years. Just don't trust users. Don't even, like, trust is not a word when building a web application. It's that simple. Um, so... Some of the approaches, you can encrypt submission data. There's a dedicated web form encryptor module. You know, you're putting the data in the database, at least it's encrypted. 
I really like this one, disabling the saving of submissions. I am uncertain for enterprise sites if I recommend storing submission data in Drupal because that's taking, it's mixing, basically it's taking submission information and mixing it with your content and your users. And most of this data really should go into CRMs. That's the end goal. You have a form, it collects a submission. It's really not, you're not going to do much of with it in Drupal. Um, and you can remote post it to a CRM. And I'm going to demo that. I think I'm good on time because I'm taking questions as we're going through. Um, with that, you can also purge submissions. So if you schedule, if you have submissions going somewhere else, or even if you're sending emails, you could have send out a contact form email and hold on to the submissions for a month and then purge them. So you're not holding on to this data indefinitely. Um, and users, you know, you, for securing submission data, I, I just bring up users, you can define user access controls. This kind of also brings up D GDPR, where there's full support for it, where you can give users the ability on their user tab to view all their submissions, to delete them, to review them, um, even edit them. And I'm going to do disabling results in remote posts because this is a really important enterprise recipe. Um, and the way to get there is to use the same contact form that we've been walking through. I'm going to jump to the settings tab. So right now there's one nuance here is I put results in the database. So I'm going to purge those results if this is going to allow me. Also just shows you the opportunity. Purge them. 50 results isn't a lot. And here's walking through the recipe. I'm disabling the saving of results. This checkbox does have logic if you have nothing going on and you're going to lose data, it warns you. It's not throwing a warning because an email is going out. So it feels that you're not really losing data when you disable the saving of results. And if I go over to here, handlers, and I add a handler, I'm going to add the remote post. And I'm going to demo using this bad URL. And it sends all the data. By the way, out of the box, it just sends the data that someone's entering and not all the metadata. A really important thing is on handler, turn on the debugging. It's always advanced at the end for every handler I've created. I'm hitting save. I go over to the test tab. I hit send. And by the way, I entered a bad URL. The debugging is working as expected because it's telling me that it failed. Red, we got a 404 error because it's not found. What's nice, it's showing you exactly the data being posted. If you're using JavaScript, it'll show you the JSON packet. And you can then debug this. Questions around that? I'm going to keep going. I got seven minutes, and this last one is really important because it's about sharing web forms and headless Drupal. I want to share my forms. So, you know, with headless, there's a tricky thing where you don't, you can't use Drupal's rendering engine, but there are some modules to help with that. There's a GraphQL web form that'll expose your web form, and then you'd build front end code to get it to work. There's a Gatsby Drupal where you can basically use React, you can take your web form and it transforms it into a React component. Um, there's a web form just shown schema, so it's exposing the whole form in the API. And conversely, there's this sharing option, a web form share. So all it is is it's giving you a snippet of JavaScript that embeds an iframe. In this preview, you see that gray box? That is a web form that's embeddable in any website. It'll go around again. And what I want to emphasize is that preview is a resizable iframe. There's a great library that was used, and I don't remember the name, but it allows that iframe to seamlessly resize in any website. And you can set a custom theme for that. So you can create a little embeddable widget and works. I think it works perfectly with a Gatsby site. That's where you're generating a static site. And, you know, then you can, in that static site, embed your web forms and still leverage the web form module. And going back to Hellas, it just can't support most of the advanced web form functionality. So if you lose the front end of the web forms and you build it in, out in React, I don't think you can recreate everything. Sharing web form, it provides the most reliable external user experience. And... Yeah, you can have dedicated themes. I think that's important because you can have a theme. I've, I've done this theme. 
if you're just theming forms, it's really simple. It's five files coming from core and you can keep the markup really simple and clean. And you know, you can style it so that it looks good on any site. In a lot of ways, you might want to use the bootstrap theme as the base. Any questions about sharing? I hope people understand that one. I think it's a feature that people don't know about all the time. Okay, I'm gonna wrap up. Yeah, good for Tomb. I think that's exactly it. I think that could go right into Tomb. John just suggested, that's the Drupal static site generator. So please, please help me, kind of toward the end of this, I always wanna emphasize support and help. And there's documentation on drupal.org, there's a community at Drupal Answers on Stack Exchange, and there's the issue queue if you have problems. And this is the last tab in the UI. There's videos about every feature and there's a video about views integration. So you can go in here, filter and find out how you can integrate views. And there's also additional resources about how to do it. And it'll just walk through the different steps. And yeah, get involved. Uh, report a bug or fix a bug, request or build a feature. You know, write or edit documentation. That's a huge help. Spread the word and tell your story. You can even sponsor or contribute a new feature. And that's pretty much it. You can get learn a lot more about me at jrockwoods.com. Um, I have my bonus tracks, so I can go through, I might go through tokens if there's no other questions, because there's some key things that if people know, it makes their lives a lot easier. Um, are there any questions before I move on? For, for Yeah, and I have four minutes left, so. No takers, okay. I'll do tokens for a quick second. Um, tokens, sometimes you need a little extra magic. And, and tokens, I think people are familiar with, they're just like placeholders for generated values. And you can use them to display submission values. So you can pull any piece of data out. They can also reference like source entities. So if you have a web form node, you can have a token that pulls that data from the node into the web form. And generally you want to use the token module, which is a, a module that provides a UI and shows you documentation about each token. And this is really important because I'm showing some really complex tokens here. And you know, this one just pulls an element title. So you can grab the title element. Oop, oh, it's gonna, okay, I'll keep, don't press it. For the remote post handler, there's a token format to grab a confirmation number from a remote post. So if your third party is giving you a confirmation number, you can display it. This is just pulling the values from the you know contact form or subject. You can generate a URL. If you do limits, you can figure out what the limit is for the web form, what's the wait time. And this is really important because it's pulling the title of the node that a web form was submitted from. For event registration, I'm pulling an event date from the event that a web form's been attached to. And these are what people don't know about. There's these suffixes that allow you to clear a token if no value is found. Depending on the context of the token, you can, if you're putting a token in a URL, you're gonna wanna encode the value. If you're putting the token in XML, you're gonna wanna XML encode the value. If your token has HTML entities, you might wanna decode them. And sometimes for security, you'll wanna strip them. And you could stack these up at the end of your token value. Any questions about that? We're at time. I went through this pretty fast. Uh, go back to my little happy slide. I like that slide. Um, I hang out for two more minutes. If you have any other questions or projects or anything, I can take a sip. I got a lot of stuff I could show. Thank you, Kate. I mean, it's, yeah, it's just so many vast little things. You got to spend a lot of time walking through. Um, here, I, I know one thing I want to show and end with. Cute kittens. How can I not end with cute kittens? And cute kittens are basically options, which I avoid, but this is a list of so if you have a select menu, these are defaults, giant lists of things. And the cute kittens are under image and you can create lists of images. And this is just a little way to kind of organize your image select elements. Um, kind of crazy what you can do with this. I knew someone, <laughs> I love that story. They were doing a web form to get barn, barn specifications. And basically they had 
images of all the windows and doors and color swatches. <laughs> and they needed the collection of all these images organized so they could reuse them. Um, we are at time. Um, Laura, you can come. I think you have the ability to unmic yourself. I, or you can text here. Can we, should we say we're done? I'm back. Yep. And now I'm back. You inside. are welcome. Since you've kind of been taking questions throughout and pausing for time for questions, mm -hmm. you're welcome to keep going until three if you have some more bonus tracks to share. Um, but I think we're all good here, so you can feel free to keep going. If well, you okay, there's 12 people in the room. If three people say they want more material, I'll go through bonus tracks with ease. I mean, if not, I'm fine moving on with my day. It's been a long day. And I probably a long conference that people have to get back to. True. Well, Charlotte's saying more. Um, she said more, more, more yeah. three times. Well, she, so yeah. that kind of <laughs> two, at least. Oh, okay. Oh, we're I, getting lots more. Okay. Okay, bring it on. Okay, I have you guys. See, this is all I want. I keep in mind, it just makes me happy. It's like okay, what what we can do is look at the the list, and I'll think about what's. I lost track of that little, oh, there's my bonus tracks. God. Um, I mean, some of these I think are, so I did show you select options. It's the idea that there's a list of options that you can control and manage. Um, with wizards and cards, I want to just demo something because it's a new feature, and I think anyone building multi-step forms needs to think about it. And it's one of the features I am most heavily invested in. So with wizards, and I'm going to go to the wizard example. Oh, my apologies on my buttons being broken. This is very funny. And this, you know what? I just gave you an opportunity to hear me talk about, and I'm doing it in a separate window, fixing this. I am currently in the middle of supporting Drupal 8 and 9 of the web form module. So there's a web form 8.x, 5.x branch, and a 6.x branch. The 6.x branch is really just trying to fix coding issues. It is very close to feature parity. Like there are not many new things. We're just fixing issues and making the web form module compatible for Drupal 9. At the same time, it's taking time because I'm getting hit with little challenges. A challenge, I hope everyone's aware that jQuery UI is no longer in core. And the web form module had the tabs, the tool tips, we're lying on it. And it's taking some time to get that code um, out of the system. Okay. so. And by the way, what I'm running right now in the background is a library update. It's downloading all the web form libraries to fix the little um, progress bar. I can keep going while that's running. The idea is going back to wizards. It's it's each. By the way, test tab is wonderful for this because it goes right here. Oh, I think important thing to say to 6.x, if you're starting a new project, use 6.x. If you already have a project, stay on 8.5x, and we'll tell you when 6.x is ready. Um, so, and it fixed itself. Each step hits the server, does validation. I have Ajax on, but it's still slow. Think about this delay if you have a long form. If you're breaking down a form into 32 steps, it gets really slow. Now you could do a preview. What cards do, and you even have the option, I'm leaving, there's a little prompt that you're going to lose more uh, your data. That's actually a configurable setting. If I go over to the build tab, it says, do you want to convert this to cards? So it'll convert the form to cards. And what that means, and I'd rather go to the example, because it really shows you the power. There's an example of cards. And let's, it's here. The idea here is it's using all client-side JavaScript to navigate through the form. So if I click next, it, client side validation says, oh, you got to fill this out, and it goes to the next one. I can even click the test tab, and this is a new feature. If I use the arrow keys, I can move between the pages, and you just can look at the performance. This is what a modern form experience should be, where you can navigate quickly through the form by clicking. Um, it has client side validation. There's this advanced feature to show all. Man, I, I love that feature because I'm working on a form that's like, 32 screens with multiple conditional logic steps, and this allows you to kind of jump around and see what's going on. Um, it is 
definitely JavaScript based. If they don't have JavaScript, they actually get what you see here happens. They get a rendering of all the forms so they can still fill it out. Um, so this is a really powerful feature worth playing with. It also lets you do those one question forms. So, and I want to emphasize when I say one question forms, because it's really powerful for surveys, is you can ask yes or no questions. You can even hide this next button. And when someone clicks on the button, it auto forwards because it, it figures out there's only one input on the page. So you can ask those like multi-step one question surveys. And that's definitely been proven to get a higher completion rate if it's done right. We are like, do you know this? Do you want that? Do you this? Because people are on mobile devices and it's click, 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 click. Um, yeah, I really like that feature. Access controls are hard, but it's important to say that every single aspect of a web form, you can decide who can access what. And there is a feature that was just, I just added it, and I think it did make it into the release. So the feature has got a couple of nuances. If I, not too much, but if I go to an app, just keep in mind, there's an access tab under settings, which you can control who can access and create and edit submissions. I'm going all the way down to an element, and there's you can decide when this element is visible to a user. So you can create administrative only elements, even targeted to different users, which also starts workflows. But I added this display element, and what it's for developers is a little property called pound access, which if you set it to false, this kind of the tooltip explains. If you uncheck this, it takes this element out of everything except the form builder. It's really useful if you have a really complex form and someone's like, oh, I don't think we want that element, but I'm not sure. You don't have to delete it. You don't have to lose the data. You're just, it's kind of like archiving it. It's disabling it. And I, I could show you, I'll hit uncheck. And it's going to gray it out and just kind of, it just sits in the background. I mean, I keep, by the way, these are all about enterprise forms. Most people don't need it. It's kind of tucked away. Um, I can keep going. Uh, by the way, if, if four people said yes and we have 12 in the room, I'm going to stick around at least till f like four. Um, oh, and I have a call for, so that works out fine. Oh, submission limits, I'm not going to go into. You can set submission limits. You can say how many times someone can fill it out. There is <clears throat> two advanced submission limits, and I may as well show you one. Um, and by the way, this this is a good example where if I go into checkboxes well, let's say we were going to do an event by the way we're on a contact form to making stuff up on the fly but we're going to say checkboxes and i'm going to just put in the days of the week and now i'm going to go over to view it and just show you what we're creating checkboxes why am i going so far? you can do some submission limits on the form but i think it's important to emphasize to advance things. And I I mean, I got inspired to also show you something else. So we have checkboxes here. In handlers, there's two handlers that you can think about. Well, first one I'll show you is you can do submission limits, ready, option, checkbox limits. It requires the saving of submission, which I'll turn on. Think about it. If you want limits, you have to have the data in the database. It's the only way to do it. You need to know what's going on. Boom, email handler. Add handler, limits. So you have to select the element. I'm selecting checkboxes. And you can say how many people, if you're doing an event, how many people are available on Monday, Tuesday? Let's making up. Oh, we don't even, we're going to say zero, you know, zero on, uh, on Sunday. Maybe we don't even, oh, you have to have one. So you'd have to remove them, which I think is fair. And you can set a default. Then you could say, how is it going to, what's the messaging, apply to each user. You could disable an element. I'm, we could leave the default. It just displays messages. If I hit save and go over to the test tab, you get individual tracking for each element. So if I, by the way, if I check off all of these, we're going to count them down. And that'll go in and reduce it. Great for an event registration system where you have slots. Or I used it for an inventory, like a t-shirt inventory. By the way, this brings up demos. There's demos, like an event registration demo. And that includes features like this. So you see the numbers went down. Saturday and Sunday got disabled. 
also gives, so we're talking about options because there's been a lot of time invested on that. There's this other really cool feature that's so hard to demo, but since we're looking at them, if I go into the email, you can route the email based on options. So I'm setting the checkbox. And now you could say, well, if someone selected Sunday, send an email to this email address. If someone selected Monday, send it to that email address. This is really powerful because it then it it makes it possible you decide how the form is going to go out. Um, for feedback forms, it's a great example where you might ask for feedback and it might be a copy edit or a site error and you could route it to the web team or the editorial team. Um, Okay. Wow. I'm enjoying going through all these things. PDF generation, it works really well. Sorry it's broken. Uh, I upgraded uh, my operating system. APIs and hooks is, I've had um, slides about it and I tend to lose developers. At DrupalCon two years ago, I did an advanced presentation. Oh, the CDN warnings. Okay, yeah. Um, all the CDN one. Okay, let's talk about web form libraries for a second. So John asked a question, all the CDN warnings in the site status report. So if I go up, so web form module took the approach of, I, we don't want to write the code every time. Like let's use external libraries, get off the island and rely on other people to provide us awesome code. And you can go to the libraries tab and it shows you all the external dependencies with documentation. So this is, you've installed the web form module and you need to get these libraries. And there's three possible ways. You can use Composer, where it'll generate a Composer file for you or update your Composer and add the libraries. There's a direct Drush command to just download it. By the way, that's, um, oh, you guys can see my entire screen. Oh, it's only sharing. I can't show you my, um, oh wait, let's see, one, Nope, I can't show it to you, but the Drush command that I just ran downloaded all the libraries. And there is an archive, a zipped archive on Drupal.org for the libraries. Now, the idea here is you want to have them installed. You could turn them off and it gives you some guidance. And by the way, I think it gives you an idea, like Algolia's places, seek editor changes, the rating widget you can turn on and off, shows you the homepage, the progress tracker that you saw is it. So. To allow the web form module to still work without these libraries, there's CDN support. And what that means is if you haven't installed these libraries, it'll work and it'll just go to CDNs. That I want people to be aware of it. So the error that John brought up is under here. If I go to status report, oh, I'll generate the status report. So I am right now running a Drush command, uh, web form libraries remove. And I'm going to cause this to happen because what it's doing is dropping every library that I have installed. And we'll hit refresh. This is my developer tool that's just figuring out little configuration inspection errors. Eh, not, and the status report now is reporting web form libraries. It's saying, and John, this is the error I think you're talking about. These libraries aren't installed. You're using a CDN and it's trying to kind of tell you, install them. Here's some guidance. Um, you just get better performance. I get skeptical of having 10 different libraries going from CDN because um, you don't get compression. So you don't get that gain. Now, if you don't like this, this is kind of like a great segue to, if you don't like something, you can change it. And what I'm gonna do is go over to configuration. My menus are working. In the advanced tab, and this is really helpful, right? I turned on the advanced menu, but if you don't like the tooltips, you can turn them off. If you don't like the help videos, you can turn those off. If you don't like dialogues opening, you can turn those off, Canvas. They do, by the way, the concept here is when I've added certain settings, people might complain and I figured I'll make them optional. You can turn off the warning about the CDN here. You can change the requirement settings. So if you wanna use a CDN, you uncheck this, um, it actually has these little checks. Um, I have to fix the grammar there. Yep. Yeah. Um, the the client side and bootstrap. So it's like if you have the bootstrap theme, it gives you a, a warning. And spam, I'm trying to recommend some spam protection. I haven't pushed that record in. You can also change, by the way, I like this. If you don't like the default ones, if you don't want John, Paul, and Ringo, 
to be your first and last name in your test submissions, you can change it. Uh, by the way, there's a little secret thing. You can refresh your configuration if you have a problem. And I think yeah, we, we are at time. Let, let's call it. I mean, I'm so glad people stuck around. We went through a lot of things. I do recommend looking up web form demos. Um, I did a presentation at DrupalCon about those, and I've walked through them. Um, okay, guys. Well, I'm going to sign off. Thank you. Yeah, I think this is great when we have the extra time. If people are into it, it's worth having the extra 15 minutes and not being kicked out of the room. <laughs> yeah, Laura, you're like, one minute reminder, that's a lot better than someone walking up to the podium and kind of staring at you with a crooked eye. Um, okay, all, I'm going to shut this down. Uh, see you on the other side.